Okay, welcome back to uh, Real Analysis. Today we're actually going to start talking about functions. What is a function? What does it mean for a function to have a limit? And what does it mean for a function to be continuous? So that's our plan for today. Let's, um, let's start off by just saying a little bit about uh, functions. So we're going to imagine throughout this lecture that we have two metric spaces. Let x and y be metric spaces. Okay, so each of them has some metric, some notion of distance on them. You might think of x as here and y as here. Okay, and uh, a function is going to be an assignment. We know we've defined this from the very beginning of class. An assignment of a, uh, a point in x to a point in y in such a way that, OK, if I plug in, if I plug in a point x here, uh, it always spits out the same answer. Okay? And you can think of that as taking points over here to points over here, right? Maybe it takes this point over here to this point over here, this point here, etc. Okay, it might map a whole, a whole line of things uh, over here as well. Okay, so this is a function. Okay, now um, there are of course many ways uh, to think of functions. You could also think of a function as uh, this is maybe m maybe the mathematical way of thinking about a function where you separate the domain and the codomain, but you've also from single variable calculus or uh, throughout your uh, education, you've thought about functions as graphs, right? So this is thinking about a function as a mapping. So this is visualize f as a mapping. But you could also think about f as a graph, right? So as a graph, of course, you'd have, you try to put these things on the same diagram, and you put x here, and you put y here, OK? Uh, of course, the way I've drawn this, this is something two-dimensional, and this is something two-dimensional. So uh, down here, you'd have two dimensions, and up here, you'd have two dimensions, right? And you see quickly that the graph is going to be a little harder to do when the dimensions get much bigger than three, because the graph of a function from two dimensions to two dimensions is going to be four-dimensional. This is why often this is a better picture to think about than <coughs> this, okay? But I mean, you, you can't stop me from trying, right? I mean, I could try to draw the graph. It would just be four-dimensional, OK? Um, you could imagine, well, I'm not going to try to draw it. <laughs> OK, great. So um, in fact, I'll just leave that here, and I'll start here. So what does it mean to uh, talk about the limit of a function? That's the question we want to grapple with. We've already talked about what it means to take limits of sequences. So um, we know um, uh, what, it, what this means. If I say the limit of uh, xn is x as n goes to infinity, we've already said what this means, right? For every epsilon, there is a n, an integer n. For every epsilon bigger than 0, there's an n such that for all little n bigger than big N, these two things are closer than epsilon, right? That's the idea, OK? OK, but what I want to grapple with is the following question. Can I t does it make any sense whatsoever Does it make any sense whatsoever to talk about the limit of a function as x goes to not some integer, uh, not s uh, in infinity, but as uh, x approaches some, let's say, p? Does it make any sense to say limit of f of x is q? What does this mean? That's the question. Can we make sense of this? Okay. Okay. So uh, let's just look at some examples here. 
right? So for instance, I might think about the following uh, function. Well, let's see. Here's a function. Here is x and uh, here is uh, y. And maybe um, I look at some points down here, like these points. And I look at where they go. So I'm, I'm, I'm drawing the graph of a particular function. It might look something like this. Okay. I've just shown you four points in this domain, and they go to some four points in the range, and I've just graphed them here. Okay. There is at least part of a function, right? I haven't maybe defined the whole function, but does it make any sense to say, okay, I've got a bunch of points here. These, these are little points like little x's. Does it make any sense to say as x goes to some p, uh, f of x goes to some q? I mean, how can I make sense of this? Of course, here, of course, I only have four points, but you could imagine maybe I have a whole interval of points, uh, have a whole range of points here, and I tell you where they go, right? So maybe this, this picture looks something like this. If I showed you all the points, right? And then you could begin to ask, oh, if a bunch of points down here converge to P, uh, what does that mean? Can I say that other points converge, that their images converge to Q? That's kind of the question I'm asking, OK? OK, um, let's see. Let's think about another example. Maybe I have a picture that looks something like this, where I have a bunch of, um, hmm, OK, and maybe my point here is P. And I look at a bunch of points here. Here's a bunch of x's going to P. And now the question is, can I talk about limits of the f of x's? Are, are these points doing something? There's the question. How do I make sense of this? Now, what I want you to notice is that, in fact, the f this statement, limit of a, of a sequence, it's actually a sequence, after all, is a function, isn't it? How is a sequence a function? It takes in a index and spits out a number. So that's, in fact, a function that looks like this. It's a function defined only on the integer points. And maybe, you know, if it was converging to some kind of limit, then what, really what we're saying is these points, as you go farther and farther out, sort of approach a limiting value, right? With me? OK. But so what's different about this is that we're, we're not, we're, we're actually looking at, we're allowing ourselves to look at points that don't go off to infinity, but maybe get closer and closer to p. And we're asking ourselves something about what f of x is doing. Yes? Good? OK, great. So um, this should motivate uh, our, our notion or our definition of, a, uh, of limits. OK. So let's see if we can, uh, let's see if we can make a, a, a precise definition here. So um, suppose I have a uh, two metric spaces. So let's say x and y are metric. And let's allow ourselves, we, we, we may be interested in functions that are only defined on a subset of the domain. So I'll take e and x. I'll, I'll require p to be a limit point of big E. And uh, let's let um, ourselves be talking about a function from e into y. Okay. So um, the picture that I want to draw here is something like the following. Here's the space x. Here's the space y. And I'm only interested, perhaps, in some subset of the domain and a function from this subset of the domain 
into y, perhaps. This is my set E. And I'm going to be picking P, a point that is a limit point of E. So you sh it should be possible to converge or get closer and closer to P uh, in E. OK? OK. And now I'm asking, does a particular limit exist? What do you think that means intuitively from this picture? Or even this picture? What do you think that means? So I've, I have a mapping down here. I have a graph upstairs. <coughs> what would you like to be true up here? Yes, Paul? Um, so if we have some image of P, call it Q and Y, uh -huh. um, then all of, the little, all of the points that are getting closer and closer to P and um, the images of those should also be getting closer and closer to Q. OK, so yeah, so we're going to say this thing has a limit, and we'll call that limit Q if whenever you, you want to say if you have a bunch of points that sort of, kind of that get closer and closer to P here, or whenever points get closer and closer to P, a bunch of points get closer and closer to, to Q over here. They're images, right? That's sort of the idea, OK? Now, um, the way you've described this, you've sort of described this in terms of maybe a sequence of points. That's actually uh, one way to describe uh, this limit, but I'm going to first do it just in terms of distances. Okay, so um, we're going to develop a criterion that looks something like convergence criterion for sequences. Yes. Do you want to be not necessarily in E. Yes, P does not necessarily have to be in E. I'll do an example later, but you could imagine, for instance, P being on the boundary here. Okay, and Q. Well, there's no relationship between P and Q necessarily, other than the fact that as you get closer to P here, you should get closer to Q here. Okay? We're not requiring Q to be the image of P. Okay? Well, I'll do some examples there as well. So, um, for instance, up here, the, uh, well, I can just do that here. Well, I'll just do some examples after I make the definition. So let's, uh, let's write this down. So what does it mean? So to say, OK, well, we could, do, we could write this two different ways. We could say f of x convert, uh, arrow q as uh, x arrow p. Or we could say it a different way. We could say the limit as x goes to p of f of x is q. So these are two different ways of saying the same thing. To say this means what? Well, first of all, it means that there is a Q. Uh, there, there is a Q that uh, satisfies this notion. So there is a Q in Y such that, OK, help. Good. For every epsilon bigger than zero, and that epsilon will be an epsilon ball around the around Q. So here's an epsilon ball around Q. Anyone okay. Okay. Yeah. So before, when we talked about convergence of sequences, we said for any epsilon. There's a point in the sequence beyond which you're close enough. Here we're going to say, for any epsilon, there's a radius around P in which if you're close here, you're close here. Okay, And so this radius would, we'll, we'll call as delta. And I want you to notice this is a delta ball. It is the delta ball that's in E. Okay. OK, so here's the, the important part. For every epsilon bigger than 0, there exists a delta bigger than 0, such that, such that what? Well, whenever you're close enough in delta for all x and e, 0 less than delta, the distance between x and p less than delta implies that uh, the distance between f of x and q is less than epsilon. 
Okay, now, there's some curious things about this that you're probably noticing. Uh, one is, what do I mean by D? D of blah, blah. That's the metric. Where? In X. What about this D? It's a metric in Y. I'm not writing metric in X and metric in Y, but you could think of it if you just if you want. This is, uh, this is, this is really a metric in those two spaces, okay? Whatever they are. If it were the real numbers, that metric would be? Absolute value, okay? Yes. Uh, good question, because we, yeah, so we'll want to, to, to deal with situations where the function's only defined on a subset. You know, like, you might have the real numbers, but you might have a sequence that's defined only on the integers, right, or something like that. Okay. Okay, the other thing that's kind of curious is I've limited, I've, I've said not everything, I'm not looking at all points in the ball, there's one point that I'm not allowing myself to say anything about, and that is if x equals p. So we don't, basically, this, this condition excludes x equals p. So we can allow p, the image of p, to be doing whatever it darn well wants to do, okay? But this is, the, this is the definition of convergence of uh, the limit of functions that you should memorize, okay? The fact that there exists a queue is kind of the, I mean, that's, that's the, where you start off. But often you have a queue and you're just trying to decide, does this limit approach Q? Well, it does if this condition holds. If for any epsilon, you can get close enough in the, in the domain such that the images are close enough in the codomain. Okay. So let's do some examples here. Here's a classic example, which um, you think of when you think about limits where p is doing whatever it darn well pleases at, with the function is doing whatever it pleases at p. We don't really care what's happening at p. To say that the limit exists just means as long as x is going to p, f of x is going to q. That's the idea. That's what it means to say the limit exists. Now, of course, x should converge to, uh, this condition should hold from both sides, yes? So that if you approach from this side, well, then you'll approach from, from above as well, right? OK, this is the graph picture, OK? This is the mapping picture. Yes, Jenny. Uh, e does uh, uh, does E have to contain every point in X where F is defined? Yes, F is defined as a function from E. But e that's that's true. That's true. Oh, excellent question. Yeah, so uh, your worry is that um, this function is doing different things at different places. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's, an, that's a, an important worry. How does that, um, yeah, so how does that uh, uh, affect things here? Are you concerned about the definition in any, in any way? Oh, yeah, so, I mean, maybe we should clarify here that when we say to, uh, the limit of f of x equals q, we mean implicitly in this space E. So your worry is, oh, maybe if you think about this function as being defined on a larger space, it doesn't have a limit. Yeah, and so this, this phrase is, it implicitly means on the domain that, of the function f. Okay. 
Okay, excellent, excellent questions. So uh, here's another example. This is uh, an example where the limit doesn't exist, even though maybe it does exist from one side or the other. Right? That's the picture I drew up there. But now you can see, here is P. If I approach P, you might ask yourself, is there a Q for which at, if you're close enough to P, then you're close enough to Q? And you can convince yourself from a picture like this that the answer is no. If you, th if you think this is Q, you're in trouble. Because if I approach from which side, can you, can you see that I won't approach this point Q? From above, right, or from the left. And then this, these things converge here. But these things converge here. And what you can convince yourself is that there's no Q that works. No Q that will satisfy that definition. Okay, So this thing has no limit at um, as x goes to p. Happy with that? Another example, we don't require e to contain p. So maybe e is this open interval, and maybe p is this endpoint. p does not have to be an e. Have to be an e. It just has to be a limit point of e. So we want to be able to talk about a situation where maybe I have a, a function defined only on E, and it still makes sense to talk about convergence to some Q. Okay, that's, that's just pointing out all the different features of this definition. Okay, great. Any questions about this definition? So. If you want to show convergence of a sequence for every epsilon, you have to find a n, an index. If you want to talk about convergence of a function for every epsilon, you have to find a delta. Right. So your, your job to show convergence is to find a delta. <coughs> to show convergence, uh, give an epsilon bigger than 0. Find a delta that works, that satisfies the rest of this, um, of this definition. OK. Let me come back to something Paul alluded to earlier, is that there's another way you can think about convergence. Here we're thinking about convergence in terms of balls. But we could actually think about convergence in terms of points that are getting closer and closer to P, and their images getting closer and closer to Q. And so this brings up our first uh, theorem about convergence of functions to uh, limits of functions. And that is, it's equivalent to think it e either way. So I could say the limit uh, as x goes to P of f of x is Q. This is true. If and only if, this is a sequence version. So this is the sequence characterization. OK, I'm not going to write, write characterization. I just went blah, 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 blah. Characterization, OK? Sequence characterization says the following. It says, for all sequences, so it better be true. If this is actually converging, if this limit as f uh, uh, of x is if q as x goes to p, what we're saying is for all sequences that what? Let's we give it a name. For all sequences pn in e, that's the first thing. They better be in e. What else? Such that, OK, there's one more condition. I'm just going to demand that none of the pn's are p. I don't allow p to be in my sequence. And Pn converges to P, good. We have what? For all such sequence, what better be true? F of Pn, the images do what? Converge to Q. And then this is sequence convergence. That's the thing you want to notice here. This is sequence convergence. OK? 
And so now that, that picture becomes the one that I just drew over here. I guess I'll draw it over here. Here is P. Here is Q. Here's a bunch of points converging to P. It's Pn. And I demand them to be different than P. And uh, their images may be f of Pn converge to Q. That's the picture you should have. Here's a x. Here's the space y. OK. Everybody happy with that? Let's see why it's true. We can prove this. It's not too bad. How are we going to prove this? Well, let's just go to the definitions, right? How do we prove anything in uh, mathematics? Come back to the definitions, decide whether or not the uh, thing you're trying to prove satisfies the appropriate definitions. So here we go. Let's go forward. You can do this. Give an epsilon. Ooh, what am I trying to show? Sequence or uh, convergence of sequences or convergence of functions? Sequences. So I'm going to start with an epsilon bigger than 0. And our goal, which will remain unstated here, is to find a, find a, an n. That's our goal. Okay. That shows that convergence, the green sequence convergence here. That's our goal. Show me that there's a point in this sequence beyond which these terms are within what? Epsilon. Can you tell me when these points are going to be within epsilon? What do you mean the n after the delta? Okay. Okay. So you you agree that for this epsilon there's a delta over here, yes? That 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 satisfies the de this definition. Okay. So what point in the sequence here would you suggest? The image of the the first point, the points that are within here. That's that's. That's the whole idea of the proof right there. We'll just write it out now. So given epsilon, we, we go back to the definition on the left. There exists a delta bigger than 0 such that, OK, it'll make me write this down. D of xp between 0 and delta implies D of uh, f of x q is less than epsilon. Okay. Okay, so for any so for any sequence for a given sequence Pn that sat that satisfies those conditions as above. What I mean by as above, I just mean satisfies the conditions there. What can we say? Well, there exists there is a point n in the sequence beyond which the distance between Pn and P is less than delta. Right? There is an n here for which this one is called P sub big N. And all the other ones are closer. Yes? And so now Daniel's thinking, for this Pn, its image is close enough here. That's the end of the proof uh, for the for forward direction. So. Little n bigger than big N implies the distance between f of Pn and uh, Q is less than epsilon. Right? Why, why is that? Well, that's because it follows from the here. This is just what I, I used by Smiley, by Cyclops Smiley, which was this condition right there. Okay, I used the condition that I assumed. And now, this is the proposed n that works. So that's the forward direction. Okay. Help, backwards direction. Oh, question, Lindsay? Oh, okay, just twiddling the pencil. 
Great. What about uh, the backwards direction? Suppose for all sequences this is true, and I show the limit of f is q. Hmm. It might be easier actually to prove the contrapositive. Let's try that. It'd be fun anyways to try it that way. Suppose the limit's not q. Let's then, what's my goal? Show that what's the opposite of for all sequences? There is a sequence for which all this is true, but this doesn't converge to q. That's what we'll do. We can do that. <coughs> so if the limit as x goes to p of f of x is not q, then, OK, help me negate this. This, is, this will be lots of fun. Let's negate this definition. So if the, to say f of x limit is, is q means this. To say that this is not q means for alls becomes there exists and vice versa. So here we go. There exists a epsilon bigger than 0 such that for all delta bigger than 0, <laughs> there exists an x. There's a point in E such that, well, what's the negation of A implies B? The negation of A implies B is A and not B, right? You have this true, but this isn't true. So such that, here we go, 0 is less than dxp is less than delta, but the distance between f of x and q is greater than or equal to epsilon. So to say that it doesn't converge to q means that there is a radius around q such that no matter what delta you give me, anytime you're within delta, uh, you, you, can, you can find a point such that uh, uh, the distance between p and x is smaller than delta, but the distance between their images is bigger than epsilon. OK, so how are we going to use this fact? This is, this is what we know so far. Can you use this, this fact to construct a sequence that can't converge to q? This might be a good place for a, a, another picture. To say the limit of f of x is not q, let's see. Let's come back to this picture where it was obvious. Suppose this is q, and this is p. To say that the limit of these, uh, uh, of the, uh, sorry, this is c. As x goes to p, this limit's not q, means that there is an epsilon around q, maybe, there's just a picture here. Can you see an epsilon around q, which would work? Yeah, it's pretty easy to see. There's, how about this one? Certainly that's going to have problems. You're going to have problems landing within this epsilon ball around q. In fact, even if you were, if q were at the end, you'd still have a problem, right? Let's make this even more interesting. I'm putting q here. Maybe q is likely to, is this one. Well, take this epsilon ball. You're in trouble on the left, aren't you? Such that for every delta bigger than 0, I don't care what delta you give me, there's a point. So no matter what delta you give me, here's a delta ball. I don't care what delta ball I give me. Maybe this one. This is huge. Or very small. It doesn't matter. I could take a smaller one. There is a, a point in this delta ball which is close to p, but whose image isn't epsilon close to q. Do you see one? Yeah, one on the left here. There's a point, little x. Image is not, not within epsilon. Okay. Happy with that? Ching Ching's happy with that. 
Jeremiah is saying, okay, well, good. So let's use this to find a sequence. What sequence would you, would you suggest constructing that would approach P, but whose image does not approach Q? Deltas? Good. Smaller and smaller deltas. That's nice. Here we go. So we'll find a bad sequence. We propose a bad sequence. This one's bad. Here we go. Let's use delta n equal 1 over n. There's smaller and smaller. And choose um, uh, x sub n by, um, by this condition, which I will call triple smiley. Would you agree that tells me there's a delta that for, for that epsilon, that there's a delta that I can choose an xn. And if I let these deltas get smaller and smaller, then what we see is xn clearly converges to p, yes? But then what, what else is true? All their images are what? Yeah, but the distance of f of xn is bigger than epsilon by smiley. So f of xn does not converge to q. End of story. They are the same thing. So it doesn't matter whether you want to talk about sequence con uh, criterion or uh, the sequence uh, definition, characterization, or the, the epsilon delta characterization. They're the same thing. OK. But <clears throat> one thing that's nice about the sequence characterization is we've already proved lots of theorems about sequences. And they all carry over now to limits of functions. So for instance, what do you know about sequences? Well, limits of sequences are unique, aren't they? So limits of functions are going to be as well. So from the theorems on sequences, here's what we know. Limits are unique. You can't have the limit of a function be p and p prime, or q and q prime, uh, unless q equals q prime. What else? Sums of limits equals limits of sums. Products of limits equals limits of products. They all follow because you have a sequence characterization, and those particular uh, uh, sums and products are going to converge as well to the, to the things you think they, they should. Right? So um, limbs, limits of sums are sums of limits, et cetera. You can say the same thing for products. Right? What do I mean by that? What I mean is you want the limit of f of x plus g of x. Guess what? It's the same as the limit of f of x plus the limit of g of x. These are all x going to some p. I'm not going to write all these out, but the point is all those theorems carry over. That's the beauty. OK. OK. Um, those are functions for, I guess these are functions for into where y is r. I guess these don't make sense otherwise. OK. Um, actually, if y is a, a greater Euclidean space, well, you have some kinds of products, right? Dot products. You could prove similar theorems as well. OK, great. So what do we have? We have described what it means for a function to have a limit. Now, one of the places where this, this is going to be very important is to describe what it means for a function to be continuous. So we're going to take a couple minute break. After the break, we will define continuity of functions. OK. Let's resume. So. Um, one of the most important concepts uh, in analysis is the concept of, concept of a continuous function. Okay, so um, 
This is one of the central concepts of this class. We now have the machinery to uh, define what we mean by a function to be con continuous. So first of all, let's build some intuition. What do you mean by function is continuous? So if I draw the graph of a function, what would you say is true about a continuous function? This function continuous? Where it's defined, anyways? Would you say this function is continuous? Everybody? Yes? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Would you say um, this function is continuous where it's defined? Two points. Defined on two points. That's that there, and that's that there. Would you say this function is continuous where it's defined? How many people say yes? How many people say no? OK, everybody form an opinion. Is this function continuous where it's defined? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Look, there are several of you who didn't vote. I want everybody to form an opinion. It's OK. It's OK. Get it. I don't expect you to, 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 to necessarily see this right away. Should this function be called continuous? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Ooh, some of you changed each other's minds here. <laughs> Interesting. OK, we'll come back to that. Why is this function, why would you say, OK, why would you say this function is not continuous? You probably would say this function is not continuous. This is a graph of a function that's not continuous. Willie. Oh, interesting. So would you agree the issue here is that as x goes to p, f of x looks like this, but f of p is right here, yes? Would you say this function is not continuous? Even this one's not continuous. This limit exists, but if, p, if at p this point is defined differently, we also have the same problem. Right here, are these points, as you approach from left and right, uh, uh, converge to something, but it's not f of p. Yes, that's the definition. This is good. Is this continuous? Interesting. But this one is. You're okay with this, right? So really, what does it mean for a function to be continuous? It means the function value at every point is exactly what you. What its the its limits suggest. Okay, that's that's the intuitive way to think about it. So, let's make a definition here. Definition. As before, x and y are going to be metric spaces. Now um, we're going to actually now we're going to consider some subset of x that the function is defined in, but this time. I want you to notice, we're going to demand that P be an element of this subset. Okay, And uh, we're going to assume we have a function that goes from E to Y as before. Okay, But P is going to live in E. OK. We're going to say the function is continuous at P. If, what I mean by it means, it means the following. For every epsilon bigger than 0, there exists a delta bigger than 0, such that for all x and e, help. I want to say the limit is what you think it is. That is, I want to say another way of saying this is the limit of, of f of x is f of p. So what would change in this definition? Not much. But for every epsilon, there's delta such that, yes? David? OK, good. Change q to f of p and? 
well, you no, know, we're going to keep delta bigger than zero, but we just won't exclude zero. We, we will allow x to be p. That's OK, too. Because after all, if you pick x equal to p, you, you, you'll have f of p and f of p, their distance is zero. That's OK. So we, don't, we remove that restriction such that dxp less than delta implies uh, the distance of f of x and f of p is less than epsilon. Another formula, another uh, definition you should memorize, commit to memory. This means the following. F is continuous at P. OK, so no restrictions anymore. X may be P. Um, the other thing here is P is an element of E. P is in E. OK, I just said that. Um, P is in E. just want you to notice that. It's, in fact, an E factorial. Kidding. Kidding, kidding, <laughs> kidding. Um, notice that this is saying that the limit is f of q, right? So really, we're saying, in fact, just what uh, uh, our intuition is. We're really saying, well, I'll just say this was P, right? Q is f of P. OK, that arrow just means, look, notice that. So really, here's the, the theorem, which follows just by definition now. If p is a limit point of e, then f continuous at p means, this is equivalent to, the limit as x goes to p of f of x equals f of p. OK? They're exactly the, 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 the same thing, as long as p is a limit point. The other thing I want you to notice is, again, so this also follows also. Check this out. Here's really what we're saying. Suppose I look at the sequence characterization. What I'm saying is if you take a sequence converging to P, then the limit of F of the sequence is F of the limit of the sequence. So if Xn converges to P, uh, sorry, if Xn is a convergent sequence, let's just say that. Well, then f continuous is equivalent to saying the limit as n goes to infinity of f of xn is f of the limit as n goes to infinity of xn. In other words, for continuous functions, you can switch functions and continuous functions and limits. It doesn't matter which order you apply them. That's a very important property. The limiting operation and the function operation commute. Okay. Okay. Very cool. So, question. Is this function continuous? Two points. I'll let it be whatever I want on one and whatever I want on the other. Take a second to uh, discuss that with your neighbor if necessary. Is it true that for every epsilon, OK, well, there's only two points to check whether it's continuous at P. So do you want to check uh, that it's continuous at this point or this one? Doesn't matter. We'll just do this one. How does this one, okay? Is f continuous here? Is it true that for every epsilon you name, there's a delta around which, as long as you're within some delta of p, you're within some epsilon of f of p? You give me an epsilon. I don't care which one. How about this one? Can I find a delta around p so that everything in here, that's also in e, also lands in here? 
Yes. So is this function continuous? Yes. The delta ball has nothing else in it except one point. Oh, this is also continuous. This function is continuous. Very interesting example. Okay. Question. Oh, no, no, it wouldn't be. Not a very good question. Because I'm demanding that everything be within some distance of the image, right? So they're, they're, we're not looking at this definition. We're looking at this one. So there's only one point you could be talking about, f of, f of p. Does that help? So automatically, if you take a, if you take a uh, function from a discrete metric space, to a, another metric space, it's automatically continuous. That should make some intuitive sense to you, right? Because discrete metric spaces, points are all separated, right? So you, you, you vacuously can't approach points, right? So you, yeah, so clearly satisfies the definitions. Excellent. Okay, well, what does this mean? Well, like before, Sums and products and quotients of functions are all continuous. It follows from the, 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 uh, the theorems about limits. So um, sums, products of continuous functions are continuous. Again, we're talking about now when y is r. Quotients are continuous as long as the denominator is what? as long as g is not 0, then the quotients are going to be continuous as well. All follows from those results. Hmm. OK. Let's see. Here's another corollary. What about vector-valued uh, functions? Suppose I map a metric space into a vector, and the functions are Oh, they all have components, f1, f2, through fk, or f, uh, in this case, yeah, k. Here's a theorem that's handy. I claim one way to tell if f is continuous is just to check what? If all the fi's as are continuous real-valued functions. OK, each. That's a nice little fact. Um, again, sums and products are continuous as vectors. Oh, yeah, b is different because these are vector-valued functions, and this is a dot product. And this is just a regular sum, but a sum of vectors. OK. Yes, excellent. OK, well, let's see why this is true. Again, it should not be hard to see why this is true. Ooh, I want to keep those definitions. Let's do that over here. Why, uh, why is A true? Well, you just have to do some bounding. So this is the proof idea of part A. You want to go forward or backwards? Your pick. Well, let's just do one direction. So would you agree I can bound? I, in one case, would you agree I'm trying to make the distance between f of uh, two points small, right? Def distance between f of x and f of p small, right? In one case. The other case, I'm trying to make the distance between f i of x and f i of p small. So. If I have that one is small, can I show the other is small? Well, yeah. Wouldn't you agree that the distance between fi of x and fi of p, this is now in the vector space, or no, in the, in the real valued, this distance, f, i of x and fi of p, would you agree that this is, is this somehow related to 
the distance between f of x and f of y. Yeah, this thing has components of, uh, that are, look like this, doesn't it? So this is always bounded like that. So you just use this fact, right? So you want to make this smaller than epsilon? You do it exactly when you make this smaller, and that will make this smaller than epsilon. Good shape. So the same delta will work. I'm just giving you the basic bound. Now, what if I have this, and I need to make it small, and I know this is always small? Well, do you know all of these are small? Isn't this just some combination of all of these? Yeah, it's the sum of the fi of x minus fi of p. And then I take the whole thing and I take the square root. And I square these, I guess. i goes from 1 to n to k. So this actually equals this. So if all these are small, you can make this small with some good choices of epsilon, et cetera. Okay, so this is basically where the, the bound comes from. And part B just follows from using components in part A. Okay. Very, very cool. So what do we know? What do we know so far? Well, we know what it means for a function to be continuous. We have two different characterizations of continuity. We have a characterization involving uh, epsilons and deltas. You give me an epsilon, I'll find you a delta. We have a characterization involving sequences, which we already understand. Turns out there's still a third characterization of continuity. And uh, this one is perhaps not at all obvious. But I will, uh, I will describe it now, and then um, we'll try to explore why it's true. So there's a characterization of continuity in terms of open sets. So here's a theorem. Very, very surprising. I claim that f from x to y is continuous if and only if for all open sets u in y, f inverse of u is open in x. What? Really? What does this have to do with continuity? What am I saying? What I'm saying is the following. Check this out. Here's a set x. Here's a function. Here's a set y. If I map this set into this one, I claim this function is going to be continuous if for any open set u I pick here, well, it has an inverse image, which might be over here. That is the set of all points that get mapped into u. The claim is, if this is open, for every open set here, its inverse image will also be open. That's the claim, if f is continuous. And if this is true for every open set, that means f is continuous. Now, does that look completely different or what? First thing I have to do is convince you that it's perhaps true. Okay? So let's take another example, maybe. Let's take, a, uh, let's take a couple of pictures that you said were continuous here. You can refer to your old pictures. I'm just going to redraw them. But you already have these pictures in your home. Thank you. Here's one. There's a function that appears to you to be continuous. Real, value, real numbers, real numbers. Here's one which was not so obvious was continuous. This one was obviously not continuous. Yeah? 
Good. We're saying the function is continuous if, oh, by the way, what do I mean continuous? I mean continuous everywhere, because I haven't specified the point. I didn't mention that. If, if you want to talk about continuity of a, a function at a point, it's this definition. <coughs> if you want to talk about continuity without reference to a point, it means it better be true for all points. OK. Well, let's see. Is that true here? If I take an open set here, is it true that its inverse image is open? Let's just see. Um, let's take this set. There. That's you. What's the inverse image of you here? I claim it's everything that, that falls in this ribbon, yeah? That produces two intervals here, I think. Produces this interval and this interval. And isn't this indeed an open set? Oh, OK. What about this? Suppose I take this open set. What's its inverse image? Hmm, what is it? It's half open, not open. This inverse image is not open. And that happened, why? It happened because this thing was not continuous, I claim. Although it's still mysterious why this is a criterion, isn't it? Perhaps. Richard's thinking, yeah, it's mysterious. Oh, well, let's just check that it works in this case here. Give me an open set here. What's its inverse image? That one point. Is this point open in the two-point set? Discrete metric? Yes. So, works. OK. Hmm, still some mystery, perhaps. Still some mystery. Huh. OK, um, I think we're going to prove this at the beginning of next time. That's probably a good thing to do. Um, but let me just sort of uh, say, wax eloquent about this, this particular theorem. This is perhaps the most useful or best definition of continuity. Okay? And I say that for a number of reasons. One is, if you're a topologist, um, you don't like referring to metrics necessarily. This is actually a definition of continuity that will hold for general topological spaces. You don't have to refer to distances or metrics. Okay. The other thing is, um, it's perhaps, um, well, that's probably the best reason why it's a good definition. Uh, it, it, it's the most elegant in some sense, right? It just refers to the topology of the real line. Like what, what points are, you're only referring to what, what you think, what, what you're considering open sets. Um, it's also a question, by the way, that appears almost in some version on the math GREs if you're going to grad school. There's usually some question that tests this, this, uh, this definition, uh, understanding of this definition. So uh, what I encourage you to do is to think a little bit about how you would prove this from the epsilon delta definition, why they're equivalent. We're going to do it next time, but it's a nice thing for you to try to do that uh, before we tackle it in, in public. Yes, question. Oh, excellent. That's coming next time, too. Yes. It turns out that you can replace open by closed here, and that's also going to be a definition of continuity. Inverse image of closed sets are closed. Why is that? Complementation. Yes. So we'll, we'll see that as well. There are a number of equivalent definitions of continuity. OK, great. Have a great day. And on Monday, we will, we will see you. Oh, have a great midterm, too. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, it's a good midterm. <laughs>